happy to be here. Uh, we've loved our time here. We've been here about six weeks. And you folks have a sweet spirit, and we appreciate you very much for asking us to come and, and lend a little bit. Uh, I would ask this morning, since you've been sitting a little while, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'm going to read from the New American Standard updated. Uh, you can read from whatever you brought along. Mark 10, 13 through 16. The book of Mark, chapter 10, starting at verse 13. And he says, They were bringing children to him so that he would touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Allow the children to come to me. Do not forbid them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. Father, we thank you this morning for this time that we have to study your word. Father, this, this time is about your word. Lord, we pray for your spirit to wash over us. Just, Lord, just be within and us in a way that would enable us to understand what you have for each of us as individuals and as a church. Father, without you, this message will be meaningless, and with you it will mean everything. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for this time that we have with you. And we do these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you to do something this morning, maybe a little bit unusual. Just look around. Go ahead, look around you. Look behind you, kind of look around. Look side, this side, left side, right side. Look around and just form an impression of what you see. Just get the, okay, you see friends. You, you know, I see some of you waving at folks. That's good. It's fellowship. I, look around and, and in your mind sort of form an impression of what you see. We're going to come back to this later. There'll be a quiz, <laughs> okay? So we'll come back to this later. So just hang on to that impression that you got. So I want to do just a little bit of discovery of this passage before we launch into it. Barbara and I have visited 12 different churches. This is the 12th since we've been here, and we've been able to help a little bit here and there. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less, but we always appreciate it. One of the things I've noticed that is not typical here, and, and Brother Scott did this. Brother, Y'all were blessed to have Brother Scott. Amen. I mean, he is a wonderful preacher, and he, did, he had a job to do, and he did that job, and I hope you appreciate that. It's not easy. But I want you to walk with me just for a moment in this passage. Let's get our heads in the passage. We're walking the dusty roads of Israel with Jesus and a bunch of other people, disciples, and some have jobs, and some fall a while, and some fall away, and some don't like what they heard, and some go away and then never come back, and some come back after they've rested a while. So we're walking these dusty roads, and, and Jesus is teaching. I want you to notice that Jesus is teaching. And so these old men, and, and, and they're a bunch of old Jews who come along, and they're not really happy with Jesus, and they want to trick him. They're going to trap him into doing something that's going to get him in trouble. And they keep doing this through his whole ministry. So they're going to ask him a trick question. They got this figured out. Oh, boy, this is going to be fun. We're going to trick him. So they ask him about divorce. Now, in the culture that he's in, if he answers one way, he's going to upset the Romans. If he answers the other way, he's going to upset the Jews. Here's what he did. He didn't answer either way. He said first, well, this is what Moses allows. Well, doggone it, that didn't work out because Moses is obviously, he's the Jew's Jew, and so they didn't get him there. And then he said something that was really astounding. He didn't answer his way. He answered God's way. He said, this is what God allows. And I hope when we read these passages, we see how this works. I can kind of imagine these old men going away and saying, we didn't get him again, you know. So now we come to this passage, very short passage, and I'm an expository preacher. I don't preach the whole Bible. I don't preach topical. I preach what God says through me to you today for this. 
particular passage. We're not going far. It's in this passage that we're going to talk today. And I've wanted to preach this passage since I got here about six weeks ago, about ten minutes after I got here. Okay, I've been praying. And thank you for asking. You didn't have to do that, but thank you for asking. So here's this passage of Scripture. And imagine now all of these disciples, they're, you know, they're on board with Jesus and they're following him around. And here comes a bunch of little aggravating kids. Oh, Oh, go away, you know, that's why they got to go away. We're, this is big people stuff. We've got stuff to do, and we don't have time for these little old kids. They're just, you know, so go away, you know. And so the Bible says that Jesus was upset about that. He was actually indignant about it. And so we're going to do just a little bit, and I hope I can stick with my outline. I'm 76 years old, and I've discovered that my brain leaks. Anybody else? Amen. My brain leaks. I learn stuff. and it don't. I spend all week writing this outline. This is no, nothing else off of the internet. This is nothing else that anybody ever did before as far as I know. This is my stuff, but it, it, I, I'm going to have to try to stick with this. So the arrowist indicative active third person singular verb means to be angry or indignant. He wasn't just a little bit like, oh, you know, okay. No, he was indignant with the disciples for trying to prevent these children from coming. Can you imagine a church that would prevent children from coming? What kind of church would that be? It's a church that's dying is what it would be. Amen? So he was indignant. The other, the other word there that is even more difficult to really get because of the way translations work, and, and, and I'm, ha I'm pretty happy with most modern translations. The King James uses the word suffer, the children to come unto me. Well, that for younger people, right, they don't get that. It's not going to mean anything to them. The word, the word allow or let is the word effete in Greek, it's the intensive form of an aorist, imperative, active verb. Get that, imperative. He didn't suggest that they let the children come. He gave them a command to let the children come. And I want you to understand that this morning. Jesus Christ commands us to let the children come. Amen? And I applaud you folks for having children's church. We're going to come back and touch on that in a little while. Okay. He commanded them to let, it wasn't just let them come, it's let them come. See, that's what we get when we, ha when we actually study God's word in the original languages and we understand the culture and language that the Bible was written in. And am I absolutely appalled by the number of preachers that I hear who don't have a clue that there are study tools now on the internet and in books that you can get this stuff. I studied Greek and Hebrew in seminary. I could have done that without it. It's just harder. I had some professors who taught me the importance of getting really deep into these languages and understanding the culture and the context. So we're walking along the dusty roads of Israel with Jesus and the disciples, and we get it now. He says, let the children come. It's not a, suge not a suggestion. Now, I, I'm just a little side note. Some denominations have stretched this all out of shape and say, well, this is, this is, this is infant baptism. No, it ain't. Okay, it's just not. There's nothing in here about baptism, amen? It's not, a, the, the, the big word for that is pedo-baptism. It's not about that. So now we, we get back to the scene here. Jesus is busying himself doing what? Bringing these little kids in and hugging them. There was a youngster who was helping taking up the offering today. Just does my heart good. Gave him a high five. A little encouragement for that young man sometimes will go a long way. Amen? We, we're, we're old folks, a lot of us. Some younger folks. Okay, good for you. But we can encourage a little one more than we know sometimes. I can remember when I was a child, I grew up up in Izzard County, a little place called Sage, Arkansas. 
But I can remember at times when some older person really impacted my life, they touched me in a way. Can, can you can you remember that? Amen? Sometimes we have more impact than we think. So now we're back to the scene. Jesus is taking these little ones in and he's hugging them and he's blessing them. This is a very important holy man in that culture who's taken the time from big people's stuff to bless these little kids. How about you? Do you take the time to bless children, grandchildren, neighbors, other little kids in this church? Or are you more about big people stuff? Oh, I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to upset some people today. <laughs> I'm not sorry either. Amen. <laughs> so here, here's, can you imagine this? The little kid coming home, mommy, 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 guess what, guess what, oh, 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 guess what, mommy, 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 what, what, what? Jesus touched me and he hugged me and he blessed me. Really? Really? Wow, you talking about Jesus, this man that all these thousands of people are following? He took the time to touch and bless and lay his hands on you? Wow. I want to tell you something. Here's the principle of this first part. Jesus always has time for anybody who approaches him with childlike faith. Amen? Now, I'm not saying he's going to take time for everybody. That's a whole different sermon. But if we approach him in childlike faith, Jesus will never be too busy. Amen? He, he's, the Spirit of God is moving in this place, and, and the Spirit of God is never too busy. Amen? He is going to touch each and every one of us just in that special way, in that special place that we need. He knows what it is. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Think about that. Let, let God's Spirit just sort of settle that down. And think about it. A church without lots of little kids is a church that's already dead. They just don't know it yet. You know, we've turned our children in this country over to video games and internet games and nonsense. I don't even see kids playing outside much. When, when, when our children were growing up, they were out with something that had wheels on it or something they could throw at something, <laughs> or something they could hit something with. <laughs> a lot of times that wasn't all that good, but it was better than sitting inside in a cave with a, with a tiny screen doing this. Amen. It's a good way to put kids out of sight and out of mind, and that's a disaster. Amen. This country is in the midst of an all-out disaster, and we're sitting around watching it go on, and, and if we want to blame somebody, go look in the mirror. Amen? It happened on our watch. Since 1986, the number of college students without a religious affiliation has tripled in this country according to a Barna study. Tripled. We're sending our kids off without much foundation and going to a college where the fa whatever foundation they have is going to be destroyed if we're not careful. The satanic control over our institutions of higher learning is absolutely astounding and it's a disaster for us and we need to put a stop to it. We need to be bold. We need to quit being mousy. You know, my dad used to have a saying. He said, son, if you're going to be a bear, be a big one. There ain't no room for little bears. They get eaten. If we're going to be a big old bear Christian, we need to be a big one. Amen? Amen? Good. I'm just making sure both sides...
just checking. We'll be out of here by 1.30. No, nah, I'm kidding. This is a 28-minute sermon. So it might stretch you into 35. So let's look now at, at another thing he said here, and I'm not... I'm not really dwelling on this. It is a major thing in this passage, but you can't preach everything about a passage. We would be here for a while. But he's talking about the nature of the kingdom. Now, I hear people, and, and maybe I've said this, I wonder what it will be like in heaven. What will heaven be like? Well, I want to go up there, and I want to ask Jesus this, and I want to ask Paul that. I, I, want to, I want to know what Peter would say about this or that or the other. Folks, I don't think we'll care. Amen? I think when we get to heaven... We are going to know the only answer we need to know, and that is Jesus is right there. And if we have childlike, listen to this, if we have childlike faith in Jesus, we are His children. What do children do? They depend on their parent. What do they depend on their parent? Their parent. Jesus is our parent. He's our father. He's our mediator. He, he is all there is to us. We don't need to know anything else. Amen. Oh, this is all good. This is really good stuff. I, you know, this, is, this has been my career is preaching from this. But when we get to heaven, the reality of this is right there. Amen? Jesus is right there. So if you want to get to heaven, what he's saying is you will either come in childlike faith or you ain't coming. Some of us need to... Okay, churchianity religiosity sometimes can get in the way of Jesus. We can get so religious that we forget what heaven is even about. Amen? D.L. Moody said that, by the way. I didn't make that up. We can get so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, or we can get so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. So the nature of the kingdom is a childlike faith in Jesus. Now, here's, here's what I've been really wanting to get to since we came here, about 15 minutes after I got here. Brother Scott's done a tremendous job of sharing things about transition from a pastor who's been here a while and looking for another. I want to share a, a little message about church growth. I'm going to share five words with you about church growth. And they're the most, these are the five most important words that you can know about church growth. Now, I was in a big church in Baton Rouge. I won't name the church, but it, I was between pastorates, and I went down there as evangelism and outreach ministry, and I was doing that. And these people had a multi-million dollar budget, and they hired a church growth team to come and teach them how to do church, church growth. I could have told them how to do it, but it wasn't my job. Five words. Six-year-olds can't drive. That's all you need to know. Six-year-olds can't drive. And I shared those five words with the last church, and I think they were kind of skeptical. I got to the last church. They didn't have any kids, none. Had one little baby, small church, no kids. Well, I was taught in seminary to just don't rock the boat for about six months. Don't do anything crazy. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Just look and learn and listen, and, and then after about six months, you can make a small suggestion. Nope. <laughs> Not me. If I was a buzzard, I would be an attack buzzard. I am not patient, okay? <laughs> I'm not sitting around waiting. This church needed help and it needed now. And so I shared those five words. Six-year-olds can't drive. And they're like, what are you talking about? We're going to start a children's ministry today, and we're going to make the children's ministry. And if you've had a bus ministry, I understand you had a bus ministry at one time. I think Brother Jimmy told me that. Thank you, Brother Jimmy, for visiting us, by the way. You, you had someone in this congregation who came to our house. We've been to 12 churches, and this is only the second that we had anybody visit. But anyway, back to this. So 
a bus ministry is okay, but it's not the best. Okay, because it usually just wears the bus ministry people out. And the people who come generally don't stay because they send the kids and they don't come. That's just in general. Maybe that's different here. I don't know. But if, if a six-year-old wants to come to church here, they will nag the britches off of mom and dad until they bring them. Because guess what? They can't drive. And if they want to come, guess what? They are coming because who wants to put up with a nagging six-year-old for very long? Amen? So if you can do children's church here that, that will be done in a way that will make the six-year-olds and so forth want to come, they will invite their friends. And when their friends come, mom and dad have to bring them and they'll come and they'll have to sit here. You see how this works? This is the maniacal little brain of, of mine working. Then those will come and if they're having fun and, and learning and enjoying the church, they'll invite other kids. And they play music that you and I might not necessarily like I don't know I don't care they're playing it over there and deacons aren't allowed to go over there <laughs> that's one thing I've learned about youth ministry never let a deacon have anything to do with youth ministry okay? that's a whole different story but they will bring their friends and pretty soon this church will change now I ask you to start with to look around I'm going to ask you now to look around again and tell me do you see a church that's predominantly old folks? Hmm. Hmm. I, I see some younger ones, but I've, I've done a count since the first day we got here. And there's some gaps here. You got some gaps. And I'm going to ask you this. Now, I'm 76, and I know there are some folks out there who are maybe that age or close or maybe a little older. Amen? I'm not getting in too far into that. I'm going to ask you this. 10, 15 years from now, do you think you will probably be here? I don't. You know, my parents both passed away in their early 80s. Who did you bring to take your place? Who's here to take your place? You have some gaps here that you need to fill. And I don't care who you hire as a pastor. Doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can do this. You know, I've seen it done. You can start a vibrant, effective children's ministry and I'm not knocking your children's ministry you have a children's church but for instance one of the first things we did at the last church was we bought a children's worship program because we had volunteers who really weren't equipped to do Bible studies and music and all the stuff that kids like to do cupcakes and the juicy and stuff like that you know, my, my theory is, is give them a lot of sugar and send them home to mom and dad, you know. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> but they enjoyed this. It, uh, we used Worship Kids Style from Lifeway. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not, but it's a program. It comes on CDs and so forth. It's very inexpensive, and it's very effective. It has the music. It has the Bible studies. It has the whole program built in where most anybody then can rotate in a two, two people at a time, rotate to volunteer to do children's church. And I promise you, if you do that, the kids will enjoy it. And they'll start to invite their friends and they'll start to nag to come. Therefore, six-year-olds can't drive. Amen? So we agree that there are gaps. We agree that 
we might not have brought our replacements. But it's not too late. It's not too late for this congregation to pull together and fill this need. Uh, Brother Scott, about the second or third sermon, I, we, I think he had preached twice before we came here, but about the second one after we got here, he was talking about how easy it is to start ministries in a church and how difficult it is to ever, ever stop one. This is one you need to really get behind. And you have, a, you have the start of it. You need to just put the effort into that as if there's, there, there isn't anything else that you can do to fill the gaps in this church. Now, I, I know there are churches there around here who play different music. Barbara and I don't really care for it. I would, I would and have told those folks that loud makes bad worse. That's my theory. Loud makes bad worse. If, uh, if, the, if you have to crank it up really loud to play it, then it's, if it's bad already, it's just going to get worse. Amen? And I, I, some of that music is, to us, it's like scratching on a blackboard. It's just bad. I don't know what it means. There's no doctrine in it. There's no theology in it. I don't know what it's about. Some of it's okay. Some of it's good. You would do well to do what the young lady did this morning and blend some of that in. If it's good, Jesus-focused Worshipful music, thank you. Amen. This generation that's largely not here this morning can be raised up here. Let me tell you the rest of the story about the last church. We started out with no children. We had 20 to 25 in children's church within three or four months. And this is a small church in a rural community. We had more kids than we had old folks. Seven years later, we had a youth ministry. We grew those. The lack of a youth ministry is a, a really hard thing. To, kid, teenagers won't come just one or two. That's not cool. They just won't do it. They don't like that. It's hard to get them to come for a youth church with just two kids. But a youth church with eight or 10 or 15 or 20, that gets good. I was pastoring one church as an interim, and uh, they had about 85 to 90 youth in their youth group. And I got to brainstorm that I would think it would be good to have the youth come over and do the whole service. The youth, the youth minister could do the message and the kids would do the songs. Whoa, that didn't go well. I had one old gentleman that got so mad at me. And I was ruining the church with all that music. Well, it's just one time. I mean, it wasn't going to be every Sunday. But here's the point. You remember I asked you to look around and then I ask you, are you going to be here in 10 or 15 years? And a lot of you, like me, won't. 10 or 15 years, what do you care what kind of music they do? Huh? Maybe they're doing some music that we're not familiar with or not comfortable with. And I'll just close with this. As long as you find a preacher who loves this word and preaches from this about God's word, not about what politics is saying, not about what society is saying, but what God says, and allow the Holy Spirit to apply it, you'll do okay. Amen? You'll do okay. Childlike faith. Amen. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we praise you that you've given us this time to come and, and worship together and hear your word in song and in word, Lord, that you've 
you've blessed us once again for the time together. Father, we, Lord, we pray for the courage, the wisdom, and the understanding, and just the willingness to reach out to the children that are in this community or maybe unchurched. Invitations, and the invitation is primarily just to respond to what you've heard. I, I don't do that altar call of salvation that much. If you're lost and you know you're lost, then respond to that. If you've heard something in this message, stay right where you are. You don't have to come forward. If you need to come forward, you need me to pray with you, I'll be happy to do that. But I hope that you will, as we sing, invitational song, I hope you'll respond to that invitation by allowing God to impress on you something that you've heard in this message this morning.